Yes, uh, welcome to another of our uh, Technovation sessions. Uh, we do these sessions periodically, as, as you know, to uh, uh, let everybody uh, discuss and, and learn about emerging technologies. Um, we always try to leave a lot of room for questions and, and discussions, and uh, we really like your participation. Um, today's topic is conversational AI, which is a bit of a formal term for what you may call uh, chatbots. Um, I, I don't know, is there, let me just ask, is there anybody here who has never interacted with a bot that they know of? I think all of us, right? It's, it's uh, uh, whether it's in your, in your car navigation system that you can talk to, or whether it is uh, uh, when you uh, log on to the website of your insurance company or your cable company, you uh, can, can chat with uh, a bot in, in text. Um, and of, of course on your smartphones and devices that you have at home. Um, but we're gonna, gonna do a couple of things uh, today. We're gonna go deep under the hood to see what makes a chatbot. And we're gonna look also a little bit about what it means that these chatbots are becoming more and more ubiquitous and, and how humans and, and machines can interact successfully. Um, so just to make things very, very concrete, I want to start with three demos of chatbots. And the first one that I'm, I'm gonna show you is uh, a very old one. So before you start laughing, Im, Im, uh, realize that this was programmed in the late 1960s. So imagine personal computers did not exist. Most people had never seen a computer in their life. And uh, somebody at, uh, I believe it was at MIT, created this, this little bot. So uh, maybe we can uh, put in a couple of uh, couple of phrases here. Uh, can you type, Kevin? Just say hi, Eliza. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Let's say I'm I'm feeling sad. Mm -hmm. So the uh, at this time in the late '60s, uh, <laughs> uh, the uh, the concept of uh, Psychiatrists became very popular. Everybody uh, was very fashionable to go to a psychiatrist. And, and really what these people did was certain, like uh, Rogerian <coughs> therapy, just open-ended questions and, okay, talk more. And uh, so that's what this, this bot really does. So, okay, tell me more. Uh, can you help me? Let's say, uh, can you help me feel happy? Perhaps you would like to be able to help you feel happy. So you, you, you can see it tries to take, and this is very primitive, it, it tries to take some of the phrases that I say, turn them around, and, and put them in, in questions to make it look like it's understanding me, even though, of course, it, it doesn't. Um, so, you know, it, we can go on, but I, I think you get the idea that this was a very tiff, one of the first, first bots a uh, very primitive program that picked up some of your language and, and threw it back at you and, and, and succeeded. And, and, and at the time, people were fascinated by this. People were uh, absolutely uh, uh, sort of amazed that, that a computer could do this. Um, so let's uh, see some other examples. And, and before I do that, I, I actually, uh, something I should have done before, I uh, uh, want to introduce my uh, two speakers for today. Um, so we have uh, Chris uh, Butler, who uh, has a long and illustrious career in, in product management and uh, worked at companies like uh, Microsoft and Waze and Kayak. Uh, I think in 2016, you got an award for the yeah. best product person yes. in the world. Well, or, not the world, but at least okay. a well, community here in New York. Okay. So. <laughs> so the UN didn't give it to me, at least. Okay. So. Okay. Uh, and most recently, uh, looking at uh, AI and bots at, at IPsoft. That's right. And uh, we have uh, Kevin Bradley, uh, who is uh, our main uh, technical architect uh, here at uh, OECT at the UN. Uh, leading all our bot efforts, and he's going to talk a little bit about uh, the sort of infrastructure and framework that uh, he built. Um, but uh, let, let's move on to the next demo. Maybe, Chris, yeah, sure. can you show uh, the bot you've been working on? Yeah. So, hello, everybody. I'm Chris Butler. Um, and what yeah, press the button on your mic. Uh, 
uh, on the left, I think. On the left? Oh, this one. Yeah. All right. Hi, I'm Chris Butler, and uh, the company I work for, IPsoft, we're a uh, IT management and services company, and so we've done a lot of work for the last 20 years really focusing on how do you automate everything around IT, so how do you take things that, uh, like resetting machines, as simple as resetting your password, things like that, and, and how do you let machines do them? Uh, what we've been doing more recently is uh, what we will refer to as conversational agents. And so this is an example, I'm not gonna go into too much about our company right now, but uh, this is something we call One Bank, which is meant to be really a template for retail banking. So um, you can imagine your local bank would use this as a conversational agent that would then talk to someone when they had questions about things. Um, and the key components here are, of course, on the left-hand side, um, the conversation that is taking place. And then uh, we also include other user experience elements. So on the right-hand side, there's maybe my statements, other things like that. Um, so one of the things that we like to talk about is, so I'm asking it if I can renew my card. So this is a question that someone may ask if they actually do need to renew, renew their card in some way. Um, but also we found that when we train these intents that people will ask this if they've lost their card. And so we're doing two things here. We're answering the question very specifically. That's more like an FAQ type of situation, Q&A. And then we're going into um, the intent, which is to actually go about replacing your card. Um, now what I can do, um, and probably the, the, the state of the art right now, is not so much just about the idea of NLP, NLU, or the identification of what this person is asking about, or the intent, but it's also the idea that we can switch between contexts. So, um, you know, whenever, for some reason, uh, whenever I call a credit card company because I lost my card, I usually find it while I'm on the phone with them. Um, and so being able to now cancel out of this is something that if you looked at even chatbots, chatbots a few years ago, they were not able to jump out of that. Um, so let's do something a little bit more complicated. Um, I want to pay 50 to Anna via ACH tomorrow. So this is one intent, a payment intent. And sorry, it's a little bit small. Um, but, but there's actually four other uh, entities that are in here, and I'm sure you'll go through all the terminology. Sorry if I'm throwing that at you a little prematurely. Um, but what you'll see here is that uh, it's asking me, first of all, um, to actually do a transaction with ACH, I have to decide which account I want it to come from. Um, so even though it understood some other things about what I'm asking, it still needs clarification about certain aspects. And so you can see here it assembled the transaction um, in the conversation, but then also on the right-hand side in the bar. Um, but another thing that we'll do when we talk about this is actually uh, telling the bot to hold on. So in previous versions of chatbots, they would probably slip up and try to say, actually, do you want to confirm this or not? <laughs> right? They were not taking into account the way that human, humans like to make affordances for other humans to tell them that, I'm, actually, I'm not going away. I still want to do this, but I just want you to hold on a moment. And truth is, is that this, this conversational agent will wait for until, at least until the timeout uh, that starts to happen. So if I'm back, um, actually, she uses Zelle and make it for Monday. So um, I'm re-engaging in the conversation. I'm doing something that we refer to as a go back. Um, so some key components of a conversational agent will not only be understanding of an utterance or what someone says, but also the business process or the process that goes with that. And so in this case, doing something like an ACH transfer is very particular. But now, because we're asking to do something called Zelle, which is a peer-to-peer -peer payment platform, there are pieces of information we can still use, like the amount and who. Um, but uh, other aspects, like I need to confirm, that I had not confirmed my service yet, so that's one thing that I'll do. Um, and then also, because of this service, it allows me to now add some type of note to this transaction. And so you can see here that this is something that previous chatbots um, would not be able to handle very well. It's not able to jump back and forth in the conversation. It's not able to change intents. It's not able to do any of these things that are really what usual human beings will do during a conversation. And so this is kind of where we're at today as far as state of the art. And from there, I'll let you uh, take over. So Kevin will show us some of the uh, framework for bots that we've been working on for use here in the US Secretary. So it's actually connected to some of the UN databases and systems. Yeah, so just to the, just the carry on from what Chris was talking, we <coughs> tell something UN specific, UN context. Um, and you both do that in a number of different interfaces. So I'm going to hand it over to Alfredo, who works for me, and he'll run through a number of uh, he'll run through a number of uh, examples of that. Cool. 
So I'm going to start off by the demo. At first, I'm going to kind of wake it up, and you'll see how, how that works. OK, Google, talk to UniteBot. Unite bot. Welcome to Unite bot. What was my last email about? Your last email was about bot status from Ashwarya Umachandran. What is my next meeting about? Your next meeting is about weekly update catch up on the 7th of June, 2019. What is my current contract details? You are an information systems officer and your funding expires on December 31st, 2019. This data is acquired from Umoja. When did I travel to Beirut? You traveled to Beirut on April 27, 2018. This data is acquired from Umoja. Who was the main U.S. trading partner in 2015? The main import partner of USA is China with a trade of two trillion. This data was acquired Comtrade. How many countries have signed the SDGs? As of September 2015, 193 countries signed the SDGs at the United Nations. This data is acquired from UNSDG website. When did the SG travel to Washington, D.C.? SG traveled to Washington, D.C. on March 13th to 14th in this year. This data is acquired from UN website. Who is eligible to apply for sabbatical leave? As of January 8, 2016, staff members with at least five years of service with the United Nations Secretariat under continuing permanent or fixed term appointments and who are expected to serve for at least two years after the completion of the sabbatical leave are eligible to apply. Yeah, so what, 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 questions to your, your contract status, your email, stuff like that. Um, so we'll move on. So this is the agenda of um, my talk. I'll give a very brief overview um, of myself and, and my team. Um, we'll talk a little bit what is conversational AI, uh, why it's relevant today. Um, we'll demonstrate the, the, the range of, of conversational AIs, as, as Lambert showed. There's some very, very basic ones, and then there's some extremely complex ones. We'll look under the hood. I won't make it too technical because of the variability in audience. Um, I'll go into a little bit more about UniteBot, about that solution, because I think it's relevant to everybody here. And then we'll finish with answering any questions that you have. Um, one other point is we've got a workshop this afternoon. Uh, what time is it, Lambert? Two o'clock? From two to four. Yep. Yeah, well, we'll actually take uh, people through on how to build... Um, I bought a basic, a very basic bot, so you can understand some of the some of the topics that I'm talking about today. Uh, a bit about myself, so I'm an information systems officer. I head the emerging technologies team in OICT. Um, my role is to understand the emerging frontier technology landscape and understand which one of these technologies is useful to the UN today. Uh, I lead a team of about ten people. And we try to understand and apply these technologies, um, which helps lead uh, policy and governance and inform management. My background, I've been at the UN for five years. I started with the Enterprise Search Project, and then I moved on to Innovation and Analytics, which focused on data science stuff. I went to Bangkok for a year and worked on smart cities. And then about a year ago, I, I took over the Emerging Technologies team. Before that, I worked for Interpol and Lockheed Martin. So what we do within emerging technologies, we research um, these specific technologies and see if they can be applied. We build pilots and products to show how they can be applied um, and frameworks and governance uh, mechanisms behind that. And we also advise uh, teams, departments, and management on these technologies. These are the four areas of current focus. Obviously, 
emerging technologies are changing all the time, but these are the areas that we've determined are, are the most pertinent. Um, AI and its subtopics, so you know, machine learning, NLP, deep learning, these capabilities. We've also done quite a bit in computer vision recently, um, included augmented reality. Um, we've got a few experts in the team that focus on IoT and the interconnectivity between these devices, and we've done a bit of work around DLT. DLT is also known as blockchain. So what is conversational AI? Ultimately, conversational AI refers to a computer system that interacts and converses with a human user to find the answers to their questions using typical conversation terms. So I ask a question, it responds, I ask another question, it follows up, it understands the context of what I'm talking about, and it tries to find the appropriate answer for me. Um, as Lambert correctly stated, uh, conversational AI is also known as bots. Um, as, as, as Lambert said as well, you've probably interacted with these systems in some way or another. Um, if you phone an airline and you ask it a specific question, you might get one of these automated services. Being Scottish, it's almost impossible to talk to these systems. <laughs> I have to put on a fake American accent. Um, you've probably used web uh, chats to try and find solutions to problems. Um, these are kind of more automated bots. And then finally, there's the kind of personal assistance that you have at home, your Alexa and your Google uh, at home, uh, that you can use to find out relevant information, like what's the weather today. Why is it relevant? Um, well, you hear a lot about all of these buzzwords. You know, you hear blockchain and AI and all this stuff. When it comes to conversational AI, it really is mature enough. Um, there's a precipice, I think, when it comes to emerging technologies that something crosses and it becomes widely adopted. Conversational AI is definitely at that point right now. If you look at how many people, as I, as I used the example, how many people are interacting with these types of systems, how many people have these personal assistants at home, even your operating systems nowadays have Cortana and stuff like that installed in it. There's, there's a move towards uh, interfacing with it, these systems in that way. That moves on to the next point of how we interact with computer systems. That's evolving extremely fast. Um, it's becoming easier and easier, especially with young people. Uh, the example that I've got is my two-year-old daughter. We have got a Google Home uh, at, at, at the house, um, and she often asks it, you know, what does this animal noise sound like? What does a chicken sound like? Play wheels on the bus. And she just does this. She's two years old, and she does this effortlessly. You know, and I think the way that human beings are starting to interact with systems is completely changing, and conversational AI is going to be pivotal to that. And then the last part um, is tangible benefits. Ultimately, what's happened over a number of years, as I think most people would agree, there's been an exponential growth in computation. Most of these algorithms on AI have been around since the 1980s, as Lambert proved with Elisa. They've been around for a long time. What the, the exponential growth in computation has allowed is these things to be refined and be much faster. What that's done is it's made things easier. What easier means, ultimately, it's widespread adoption, um, simplification of complex processes, and reduced cost. So this slide here just gives an example. From the left is kind of simple, all the way across to something much more complex. So the simple Q&A system was the one that Lambert demonstrated, Elisa. Uh, a standard bot, obviously there's a massive jump between that and the next, the next part, which is a standard bot. That focuses much more on natural language, on human, humans' ability to, to ask a question in, in multiple different ways and it to be interpreted as the same thing. As I said this afternoon, we'll build a bot and we'll build a very standard bot. Um, the, mo the next up from that is a, an advanced bot. What that does, very similar to Amelia, what that does there um, is that it takes a number of different domains and, and, and puts these together. Um, it also adds advanced features like complex conversational <coughs> flow, dy uh, dynamic direction, recall, stuff like that. Uh, obviously, I'm biased, so Unite <laughs> Bot is just a wee bit further, um, and I'm sorry about it's that. Okay. Um, Unite Bot, <laughs> obviously, we, we've done a lot of work, a lot of work, and we're continuing to do a lot of work. There's multiple layers to this. Um, but what that does, obviously, is it's UN specific. Um, we cover a number of languages as well, which is obviously extremely important for the UN. We have covered things like complex conversational flows, the ability to jump between different topics and it to, be, to be able to do that effortlessly. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. And I think the most complex that probably you've seen 
is good go to Plex. Um, if you haven't seen it, I think you should try and do a search and look it up. It's fantastic. It's very much a, it behaves like a human and, and, and phones a restaurant and phones a hair appointment, I think. Um, but, you know, there's, there's ethics around that that Chris will, will talk a little bit later. So, under the hood, there's a number of different components, but I think these are the most relevant. Uh, Chris mentioned some of these terms. These are the most relevant terms. These are the most relevant components as part of that system. Ultimately, you have a question. You know, when is the next UN holiday? So what does that mean? Um, that, that question is, is, is the, the, that's referred to as the utterance. Um, from that question, there might be some transformation required to get that question. For instance, if I'm asking speech, then it might need to be translated into textual format using speech-to-text methods. Um, then, once you've got it in textual form, it goes into meaning. What does this What does this sentence mean? What does this question mean? Is it referring to a holiday? Is it referring to an email? Is it referring to policy? That is known as the intent. From that, you can also deconstruct the sentence um, and find the useful parts. What parts of that sentence is really telling you something? That's known as the entities. And again, so y you use complex methods to do that using natural language process and natural language understanding. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. The next part, is, as Chris was speaking about as well, is the flow. Is, you know, it's a domain-specific topic, so if it's a bank, there's a specific flow. If it's an HR topic, it's a specific flow. We call these decisions, and they're referred to as decision trees. From that, from those first four parts, I can then make a query. I can then go to the relevant database or, or data repository and make the appropriate query to find the right answer and construct that response. So that's the mapping aspect, which is also complex. This here is a very simplified example of a conversation flow. It's just one question and one response. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see kind of four blocks. That is all to do with speech-to-text. Um, if, for instance, you have a, a text-based uh, bot, then you don't have to really focus on that. But if I ask the question, is there an official holiday in June? First of all, it detects the language, then it does the transformation of speech to text. From that, I have the textual sentence, which you can see in the middle. Um, the next part is I obviously have to detect that language again to see, is this English, is it French? Because you train corresponding models that, that, that calculate the intent and the entity uh, recognition as well. So once I've identified that it's English, then I go into the intent resolution. From the intent resolution, I do entity recognition, result mapping. What I mean by result mapping is ultimately taking those aspects and, and identifying something that I want to find, and then the system mapping is just the back-end system, how I connect to the back-end system. From that, if I've got an appropriate response, then I will, I will do a, res a response preparation. What I mean by that is that depending on the way you interface with a system, it can be just a textual response, it could be a speech-based response, or it could be something a little bit more advanced, like, a, like an adaptive card, something more visual to make it uh, more interactive for the user. So the, the response is at the bottom. Yes, there are official holidays on X and Y. And again, you know, language detection and then the opposite transformation of, of text-to-speech. The next part um, is intent. So, you know, as Chris mentioned, and, and, and I mentioned in my previous slide, one of the key components is intent resolution. Um, we use a thing called supervised machine learning <coughs> techniques. So we label sentences and we train customized models to identify whether what is the probability of this sentence matching a specific category. So you can think of an intent as a category or a bucket. Um, and I've gave a few examples there. So is there a holiday for Memorial Day in New York? So that might map to an intent that I have identified. It's called Holiday On, and it's got a 92% probability, so that's pretty decent. Um, the second one, what official, days are, what official days off are there in June? Again, it maps onto that intent. So if you look at the first two sentences, they vary very much in language. And, and you've got synonyms there. Days off is the same as vacation, is the same as holiday, is the same as many others. So what NLP and NLU does is it allows that kind of flexibility in the language. So based on that, then I construct the appropriate responses, as you see on the, on the right-hand side. Um, and the last two sentences at the bottom are just another example of a different intent, 
different questions and different uh, responses. The next part is entity recognition. This is extremely important. This is actually the parts that you know, matter the most, I think. Um, and it's about, again, we use natural language processing, natural language understanding, and notably named entity recognition and part, part of speech uh, tagging uh, to, to identify and extract the, the relevant entities that, that, that can be used for later on when I want to do the query to the, to the back end system. There's two types of entities. There's built-in entities, places like like location and dates and times. These are all these all tend to be built, and these don't really change very much. New York is New York. You know, the first of January is the first of January, so these tend to be uh, built in, and you can reuse those as part of Unite Bot. We are building a range of uh, custom UN specific um, entities, things like duty stations. You know national holidays, etc. These, all these things. So we're building all this as part of that. So again, if you look in this example here, regarding the utterance, it's the same utterance, but what I want to ultimately extrapolate there is the holiday name, because that's what matters to me, and the location. Because every duty station, it might be, I might want to search, you know, what is the, is there a, is there a holiday for Memorial Day in Bangkok? The answer would be no, but it applies in America. Um, and you can see the, the entity type on, on the right-hand side. The, the next part, again, is to do with, with the conversational flow. This is very, very important. This is what makes the system feel human um, in many ways. The other parts are just to, to kind of process that, but this is the part that makes it feel human. This looks. This is called a decision tree. It's a computer science-based uh, terminology, and it's, it's based on uh, that data structure. Um, this, this example here would be an HR officer constructing a conversation flow for, for employee benefits. I hope you can see that, it's a little bit um, small. But the idea here is you can see that it's a branch of a tree. Now, if you map out a, a really complex process, that becomes huge um, and is part of more advanced um, bots like, like Amelia and, and, and UniteBot. We, we use deep learning capabilities to actually map a lot of this dynamically so that we don't need that. We maybe just need a domain expert to just corroborate and make sure this is correct. But overall, we will build this dynamically behind the scenes. So just to be transparent, there's a number of uh, available services out there um, that, that exist. Um, some of the, the, the big players are obviously Google. Um, the, the, the workshop we'll do, we'll use Google Flow as um, is, is an example. Uh, Amazon, they, they allow you to build bot capabilities. Microsoft, the, the Unite bot uses components of the, the, the Azure ecosystem. There's Facebook, there's IBM Watson, and of course there's very fantastic customized things like, <laughs> like Amelia, you know. Um, so Unite bot, the, the demo that we gave you, so the purpose of this is, um, is to provide a standardized framework and governance process for conversational AI delivery throughout the United Nations. Um, allows others to build their own or integrate with the, with the universal solution, which is the, the, the solution here that we've got. The key benefits, um, you know, as personnel of the UN or even as the general public, trying to find a specific information on UN context is extremely difficult. You need to go to multiple systems, you need to scroll through pages of search results. Um, what UniteBot will do is it will allow the general public or you as an authenticated user to go to a single place, ask a question and get a response back. The tailored information, that's whether you're authenticated or unauthenticated, um, and also that will be domain specific, but obviously it will tailor its language, it will tailor the information that it provides to you um, based on your questions. We've, <coughs> we've integrated with a number of uh, existing systems, as you heard some of the examples, including the authentication system, the email system, etc. cetera. Um, most importantly, I think, the power of these types of bots is concise responses. If I ask the question, how old is the SG? I want to hear back 70 years old. I don't want a biography of the SG. I want a concise, straight to the point answer, and that's, that's what these solutions tend to do. Um, as I says, we're using extremely complex AI uh, capabilities behind the scenes in this, this project we've got called Cognition to automatically extrapolate knowledge um, from unstructured data, build these dynamic decision trees and help you answer questions. 
And the last part is obviously it has to be secure and customizable. These are the interfaces that we have, we have built as part of this. Um, it was important that we try and go across the spectrum. So we wanted to ensure that we covered some of the speech-based capabilities, the textual-based capabilities as well with some of the, the more uh, prominent platforms and even some of the legacy systems like email and SMS if you're in a low connectivity environment. We've faced a number of challenges. I think I've got more and more grey hair as the weeks went on with this project. Um, one of our biggest challenges actually has been the, the service maturity. This is like a very fast, uh, ever-evolving environment and, and we've we have struggled but overcame the, the, the speed at which this, this environment changes. Um, so that, that was one of the, the main issues. Another real issue is obviously we work at the UN and everything has to be in the six official languages. Many of these services work in English, French, Spanish and Chinese, but they don't cover Arabic and, uh, sorry, but Ar Russian and Arabic. So we had to find solutions to that problem because, you know, you have to solve that. Uh, system mapping, anybody that's ever worked in IT and the variability of the back-end systems and the data and the queries and stuff like that, that was another challenge that we, we've managed to overcome. Um, a massive technical challenge was context ambiguity. So that's regarding these entities. So it might, I might ask the question, you know, is there a holiday in June? But what does June mean? Does June mean this year? Does June mean next year? As a system, you don't really know what that means. It's, it's ambiguous. Um, so we have built a number of capabilities behind the scenes, custom, custom algorithms and, and machine learning solutions um, to try and understand that and, and, and solve that ambiguity. Obviously, as well, a complex conversational flow. I mentioned earlier on that we've, get, we've got these in place and the ability to jump between different uh, decision trees, the ability of recall so that you can jump up and down a tree, or you can go back a couple of questions or, you know, um, and, and, and I think this is extremely important, as I say, for, for feeling like it's a human interaction, feeling like it's a natural interaction. And obviously one of the other biggest challenges is the expertise. This is a multidisciplinary type project. So there's computer science, software engineering involved, data science, you know, f everything from, from machine learning, deep learning, AI, to linguistics, and, and obviously domain experts depending on, on the skills. So version 1.0 of UniteBot, which we'll be releasing soon, um, will have these core skills. We talk about a skill as a self-contained kind of focus area. So obviously you've got email, calendar, holiday, which I've used some examples, the UN journal, trade data, SDG data, analytics, news. I mean, the list goes on there. The reason that we picked some of these skills was to give a good variability um, on the, the types of data, the types of information we want to find um, and expose some of the kind of more advanced capabilities that we've built, like text summarization, geospatial searching capability, stuff like that. The key features of UniteBot is the official UN languages, multi-interface, authentication, the complex conversational flow, existing system mapping, and more importantly, reusable templates. So if there's some people here that, that you want to build their own skill, you know, they can either take one of those templates or we can assist them to build their own skill and their own template that can be reused elsewhere. And that's really it um, at this point for me. As I said, I didn't want to go too deep technically. I hope I've covered enough, but if you have any questions and answers, I would be happy to, to answer them. It's skill specific. So in some skills, there's no human agent. You know, if it's a help desk related problem, then yeah, you would, would, you would have a process of escalation there. Um, we're working with Microsoft to, to actually, they are, they are cutting edge stuff at the moment. Um, we're working with them because they're actually doing that form of escalation as well to, to agents. But again, that's skill specific. That's all about skill design, conversational flow, understanding the requirements. That's really business process more than kind of technical challenge. Another thing that I never mentioned as well is there's different ways of building um, chatbots. 
So there's a thing called sequence to sequence models. If you've got transcripts already of specific things like help desk uh, questions and answers, then you can use AI capabilities to build that dynamically. Otherwise, you can go the kind of more rudimentary route of building these decision trees. Um, hopefully, I mean, if you build these things correctly, it should feel intuitive, you know, and, and I don't know how far we are along in that. I mean, we were speaking about, I don't know how far we are along in that, and there's still a bit to go, but it should, it should try to feel as intuitive as possible. You know what question you want, you kind of know where you want to go, and the, the bot itself should help guide you down specific paths and try and provide as much information back to you. So I don't know how much training there should be. I think there, there, there will have to be. But um, as I said, we would try and build it in the most intuitive way possible. Um, <coughs> I, I was in China doing an um, AI, AI study of the Chinese market. So it's uh, very interesting to compare the two markets. Um, one of the things I'm interested to find out is for the, the, um, the demo of the United Bot. Uh, is there any like uh, when you talk? Do, do you have a recording of the the? You have to turn on the United Bar for for them to listen to you. So what about privacy? Because uh, you keep recording the person's uh, information, right? So we don't plan to keep any transcripts. So that's why I was speaking about. Okay. If you have transcripts, you can build these more dynamic things where you've got the rudimentary. You know, that's, that's a policy decision that we've not covered as yet. It's obviously a data privacy decision, but we don't plan to retain any transcripts because, you know, I, I don't... I, that's maybe something that Lambert but, and okay. etc. can answer. But, but if you don't retain the interaction, how do you make your bot more, more intelligent? How do you keep it... That's a very good point. Yeah. So there's, there's a balance here between, you know, what's, uh, what policy de determines and what we can determine. Again, it's you can retrain these models using supervised machine learning capabilities mm -hmm. but if you don't have the transcripts then you can't retrain them but again if, if you look at the decision tree if the decision tree is there on HR policy at the end of the day that policy exists mm -hmm. you don't really have to change the structure of that tree you know but again that's that's a policy decision that we'll, we're going to speak about very shortly on whether we retain that and make things much more dynamic or whether we don't retain it and we try and keep it you know a little bit more structured and does the, the United Bot have the capability to convert conversation into text? Yes, of course. Yeah. It does? Yeah. So would that be helpful for a lot of the UN meetings to, to record the uh, transcript of the meetings? Yeah, so, you know, we've got another of other, so in, in my team we've got a number of other projects that we're working on. As I said, there's this other project behind the scenes called Cognition. Um, and we've got a number of services as part of that project. Some of this is speech-to-text capabilities. Uh, Q and A builders, stuff like that, but that's that's for another time. Okay. Thank you. Yes, congratulations. This is really fascinating. Great job. Um, I have a question regarding the demo, and my question is on authentication. When you ask for your contract date, so how did it understand that it's you, and it looked in the mojo for your specific information? I think that was really <coughs> fascinating to see that's actually taking place. Because um, what initial idea was to use multi-factor authentication that I would say, you know, what is my email? The bot would come back and say to me, uh, what is your index number? I would give it my index number. Then it would say, you know, I'm sending you a multi-factor authentication to your phone. Read that out to me. You would give it back. We went, we went back and forth and, you know, with security and other people and we were like, this, we don't know if this is the right approach. Um, so we settled on the ability to just link accounts. So you know, in your Google or your Alexa, you have the ability, the same way you can link your Spotify, you can link your Google Home to your uh, Unite ID, and as soon as you're authenticated, then you have the ability to ask authenticated questions. If I was unauthenticated and I tried to ask that, I would say, I'm sorry, not able to answer that question for you. Thanks so much. Uh, first of all, is there any... Turn on your mic. Okay. Uh, hello? Now better? Yes. Uh, so is there any statistics about technology adoption? Because I know here in New York everyone uses Siri and everything, but 
how is it in Kenya, how is it in, in Myanmar or mm -hmm. any other country. And second, the United Boy <coughs> bot is amazing. <laughs> it's like, and, and do you have any plans for deployment and how it will be deployed? It will be like in ISIC or? Yeah. One day. <laughs> so on your, <laughs> on your first point regarding the statistics, no, we haven't, we haven't collated any statistics on, on the adoption and the use. Um, again, you know, this is, this is Google Home and Alexa. Obviously, in, in China and some other parts of the world, they, they might not use that. What we are trying to do is we're just showcasing the interfaces and building the capability in whatever, you know, solution or whatever, however you interact with that system. It shouldn't make a difference. So in Kenya, maybe they, maybe they don't use voice-based capabilities, but they use text-based or they use SMS, it doesn't matter. Unite bot, that's why we have that variability in the interface. That's why I think it was important to do that. But we didn't capture any statistics on that. I would be very interested to, to find out more about that. Um, on your second point, yes, it will be deployed. It will be deployed with those uh, version 1.0 skills for staff member and the general public. And as I said, it's more about policy and governance. It's about giving back to some of the other ID departments and whomever other departments themselves who want to build their own bot. It can be an isolated bot or it can be an integrated bot, a skill. Um, and, and as part of this governance process that we are working on, we would we would provide that service for you or help you even build that yourself. Yeah, just to, to add with regard to the deployment, what you just saw, this, this little demo and all the, the skills that, that Kevin displayed, this is not meant to be the final bot. This is just a, a framework. This is a series of, of templates. And the idea is that we, we use this basis. If, for example, you work in, in uh, OHRM, uh, in, in HR, and you want to create a bot with all of the policy questions, et cetera, or for, for staff, uh, we're happy to work with you to build on these basic capabilities where it can understand dates and and concepts like like annual leave or entitlements and and these kind of things and built that out and, and for all different areas, so and as you've seen all the different <coughs> interfaces you can even access it through via email or SMS uh, telephone we're planning to connect it to the telephone system as well, uh, so there's different options for for creating bots out of this. Hi, my name is Mong Kong. Uh, I'm from the MSPC. Congratulations on the United Bot. It's, it's great. Um, I want to be a devil advocate here. How do you detect bias in accuracy? Isn't it better to say, I am confident with this, when the bot answer? <coughs> is it better to say, I'm confident 100%? Or I'm, 100%, I'm confident with 95%? Mm -hmm. Because in, incorrect information can lead to, you know, yeah, something. That's that's absolutely true, and that's a hot topic in the area of AI. But again, we at the UN we work with the truth. At the end of the day, if I ask how many days annual leave do I have, it's twenty five. It's no twenty five. I'm a hundred percent correct on that. So we tend to work with truth stores. You know, real information. Again, that's down to the skill and the specific domain expert. The domain expert determines. And if if there was any ambiguity on we're not sure on this answer, then we would, we would find the appropriate response for that, definitely. But yeah, so that's, a, that's a hot topic in, in AI at the moment because if you don't, if you don't uh, account for uh, bias in data, then it can, come, it, can, and it can lead to some very strange things happening. So there's going to be uh, some more free time at 12 o'clock, at least half an hour to talk with any of the presenters or any of us uh, bilaterally. Or So if you have specific questions or want to implement a bot, we can do that. I wanted to move on to the next uh, presentation. Uh, we want to look a little bit more at uh, if these, these bots are going to be everywhere. We're going to use them for, for many different systems. Um, what does that mean, humans interacting with bots? What are the... the, the benefits and, and maybe also the dangers, the things that we need to be aware of. Um, Chris, can you tell us something about that? Yeah, one second. Let me just... Of course, it's... Mm. Sorry, one second. Yeah, sure.
So hi, I'm Chris Butler again. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how uh, when, we, when we refer to conversational agents, how do we build them in a way that's good for humans and the machines uh, to interact? Um, and so I'm going to go through, you know, what are conversational agents maybe from a slightly different viewpoint. Um, so a lot of really great information. Thank you. Um, but then I'm going to talk about interpretability, building trust, and then ethical implications uh, for these types of agents. Um, already got a really great introduction. Thank you again. Um, but this is my email address, and then that's my Twitter handle if you want to say nice things about me on the internet. So feel free. Um, so what are conversational agents? And usually I, I like to start, uh, whenever I talk about AI, I, I also do this, but what is it not, right? Um, the first thing that it's not is it's not the chatbots that were really, really popular or hyped up about two or three years ago, right? Um, and so I just want to make sure that there has been progression. We're still not quite at the amazing levels that we want to be for human conversations, but we're along a lot of the way there, basically. Um, it's also not, you know, there's definitely a idea that you can take things like web forms and then jam them into a conversational interface and that's good enough, but it really isn't. And I think we've shown that over and over again that that's part of the problem with the hype that happened a couple years ago. Um, it's also not HAL um, at this point from uh, 2001, right? It's not something that is so intelligent um, that it is trying to make decisions on our behalf. Um, and it's also not her. It's probably, you know, most people will not fall in love with the conversational agents that are available today. Um, and so what are they? I tend to use a, a fairly small set of things that I would say uh, make a good conversational agent today. And of course, this is evolving, but I think this is a good set um, of how we expect these things to work. Um, so one, they're semantic in that they understand the context of the situation and the conversation. Um, it allows for multi-turn. So rather than um, one question, one answer, there can be multiple questions, multiple answers. It's context aware in some way, and I'll talk about what that means later, but really context aware in the conversation with the people that are in the conversation. It's able to take action in some way, so it's not something that will just give you necessarily Q&A, because I think that's valuable, um, but there's something more about usually behind that intent, there's something you need done. Um, there's conversational recall, so uh, what we refer to maybe in the, the industry as episodic memory is really how do you... How do you understand context um, from the standpoint of multiple conversations? And then how does it learn over time? Because uh, especially, not even just from the standpoint of what does this person want to do when conversing with this conversational agent, but how does that person and their experiences in the rest of the world change the way they want to interact with that conversational agent over time? And where are they? Um, you know, we already talked about all the different channels that are out there, um, but I think the assumption today uh, rather than just one place, people actually expect to be able to have conversations in any of these channels. And so when we look to the future of what we need to build, it's not just about voice or about web or about SMS, it's about all of them. Um, because people have different needs in different contexts uh, physically. And so that then means that they need to have different channels to access that information. And finally, you know, when we think about what conversational agents really are meant to be is to be human-centered, right? Um, the reason why they exist, and I'll go into maybe the, the most important context in just a minute, but it comes down to the fact that us humans need ways to interact with complex situations and mechanisms, and the way we do that is through conversation. That's the way we do it today. Um, we also include a lot of other things when we talk about a good conversation between someone, two different people. There's a lot around body language. There's a lot about history, about trust. There's all these things that we bring into conversations, but in the end, conversations are about humans. They're not about machines. And uh, I, I definitely, uh, I think I use this uh, particular graphic in almost every talk I give, but design thinking is one of those things that allows us to be very human-centered. Um, this isn't a talk about design thinking for AI, so I won't go into that very much. Um, but there are a bunch of uh, the talks I've given about this previously, so if you want to look those up. So what are the key aspects to building a great conversational agent, right? If this, if this is our definition that we're working off of, um, the first one that I really like to go into is interpretability. Um, and interpretability, you know, I think within the AI community, within the machine learning community, uh, there's a lot of different examples of what it means. And I'd, I'd say that also the term explainability is used an awful lot. Um, I tend to prefer interpretability because it thinks, it's more about the idea of how do I as an individual use this information longer term rather than how do I just know what the machine is doing. Um, and this is a explainability versus interpretability in one act, and this is the only machine learning joke I'll use in my presentation today. 
Um, but the mom asked the child, why did you kick your sister? My attention was on her. Mom, be more specific because of the vector. Uh, and then C embedding, number, number, number. Don't make me decode that. So this is explainability. The child said specifically why they did something, but it's actually not helpful or interpretable to the mom. There's no way for the mom to now take action in some way uh, to change the behavior uh, that just took place. So that to me is, is where I like to make the distinction between explainability and interpretability. And systems that need interpretation need conversational interfaces, right? There's lots of different ways that you can understand what a system is doing that's visual as well, but most of the time you need to start with some type of conversational interface. And this is a bunch of bullet points, but, but really there's, there's two sides to this. There's the left-hand side, which is how is it that as a human, I need to be able to get something done with a system? And then on the right-hand side, what does the system actually need to do? And so in conversation, right, it's mostly about non-experts interacting with the system in some way. And then behind the scenes, usually experts are in some way going into the system, modifying it, uh, changing it, or even taking action within it. Um, and the reason why is that there's this imbalance of understanding. So in the conversation, I need to disambiguate because I don't necessarily know the right terminology or the specific terminology. Um, I, I need to be able to give context about why I'm asking about something. I need to be able to get context back. Um, I need to resolve the intent based on what the processes that are available to me. I need to be end goal focused. So it's not just about having the conversation, it's about doing something with the conversation afterwards or getting something out of that conversation. And then finally, it's non-deterministic. Human beings are real, you know, we are biased and have a lot of assumptions, but we're also semi-random because of the way we interact with the world. And so we're, we're, we're individually emergent phenomenon from the things that we deal with on our daily life. Um, and so that means that we're non-deterministic and that means that conversations need to have flows, they need to go back and forth, et cetera. Now behind the scenes, when we talk about IT systems, right, um, for new companies, you're generally talking about, say, tens of systems. For organizations that have been around for longer, you're potentially talking about hundreds of systems. And I'm sure here at the UN, probably part of the integration problem was the sheer number of systems that have been deployed and exist, right? Um, and the truth is, is that there's only particular people or sets of people that are experts in any one of those individual systems. And there's not always overlap. And also, most people will never learn how to use those systems specifically. <laughs> so that's where conversation really comes in. There's interdependencies, there's nuance um, that only the people that are really experts in these systems can, can really understand. And then finally, when we talk about machinery, there are ways to have them understand non-deterministic behavior. But the truth is, is that they still need to follow a process. When we talk about bureaucracy in the most polite way possible, it's because we found that to be a heuristic that works in this situation. There are ways that it doesn't work as well, um, I'm not going to go into that here, but uh, that's, that's, I think, where there's this kind of tension, natural tension between what a conversation is doing and the systems that it needs to interact with, okay? And that's about context. And so gaining context is, is uh, pretty difficult. And so part of the tool, some of the tools we use, like NLP, NLU, to be able to understand intents and entities is a good starting point, but it's not everything. And I've tried to create, I guess, a in priority order, um, the, the, way, the types of things we need to understand to really be able to pull together what is valuable to an individual. And so at first, it's maybe who is that person? What is their information about them in particular? Um, maybe after that, it's what is the behavior that they have exhibited most recently? How are we now able to take those pieces of information to then infer or predict what they could want? Um, we could pick up information from a previous conversation. And then finally, we can ask which I think is maybe usually the worst case. <laughs> and so, um, and then, you know, I wanted to throw in sentiment here because this is something that comes up in a lot of NLP and LU uh, groups and topics. Um, so the idea of understanding emotion from text uh, or even voice, which is a little bit better, um, but there have been papers as recent as about a month ago that show that it's actually very hard from just pure text to discern what a person is feeling uh, at that moment. Um, and the reason why is that generally emotion is the way that we, as an interpreter of the emotion, understand someone else's emotion. And it's not always the correct one, but it's one that we're interpreting in that moment. And so that's why context is so important, but also why if we expect a machine to truly understand our emotional states, we're probably gonna be waiting for a long time. Um, so that's just something I like to throw. I like to throw a little bit of cold water on the sentiment analysis aspects of these things. And then the next part, when we talk about context, once you have that context, the second key point of interpretability is really how do you build abstractions of these systems in some way? And so let's, you know, abstractions are, 
term that comes out of computer science that really means how do you take something that, you know, say a microchip, how, how I was physically laid out, and then build an abstraction above that so that I can then lay out a, a logical computer system? And then how do I build a layer of abstraction above that where I can actually do programming through interpreted languages? And so that's abstractions, right? Um, I like to talk about abstractions in another way too, which is for human interpretability. This is a, 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 an article from the New York Times, and in particular, about uh, how the reason why the MTA is so slow. Um, so I, you know, I love this as an example of how interpretability could have improved the decision-making capabilities of the MTA. Um, and so when we talk about abstraction, we need to look at what the level of abstraction is. And so this is one level of abstraction, right, for the MTA, is that I'm actually sitting in the car, I'm understanding how this train is actually operating. There's a level above that, which is sitting at a switch for these trains, and this is actually the real switches that are still being used. Um, that's another level of abstraction. I can go above that and I can go to this center where it's actually understanding all of the different trains that are there. And I think when we talk about the idea of policy decision making, the issue here is that ne none of these abstractions actually help make the right decision. Um, and this is an example of an abstraction that the New York Times put together, which on the left hand side, there's two different factors that really contribute to slowness as they imagine it today. And these are like the, the conditions or the factors that are really impactful. And so one is how much spacing happens between the trains um, in the, the vertical. In the horizontal, it's how much more delay uh, do you provide at different stops. And so you can see that there's a red to kind of yellow coloring. And that's to show the impact of these two factors against each other. And then the right-hand side is showing very specifically what does this mean when it comes to how you change these factors. And so this is a level of abstraction, which is a visual one, not a conversational one. But it's one that would have allowed people to look for something where you can maximize or satisfy the different factors that you're really trying to provide, in this case, safety, but then also do it in a way that is understandable by real people and, and policymakers, right? Um, so this is what I mean when I say abstraction. Right, and so how do we balance this type of complexity and usability, because that's really what an abstraction is about for conversational agents. Um, and so I put together, again, a list of things. Um, so allowing for topic switching of conversations, using the language people use, and I don't just mean that as you know, either English or French or Chinese, but also the fact that um, when we talk about, say, you know, we do a lot of work with insurance providers, and so insurance providers, they talk about policies and members and underwriting. <laughs> No one uses those words when they ask about their insurance. Um, and so using the actual language is really, really important. Um, using analogies, right? People are analogy machines. So how is it we provide them with that information that is analogous to the situation they're in or how other people are in that situation so that they can understand? And then finally, in really two pieces, you should only really be providing enough information to make a decision, right? You shouldn't be providing them with all the information. But there's a tension with the fact that you need to give them enough information so that they can have the agency to make the right decision for themselves. So that doesn't mean you obfuscate things necessarily. It means you give them the real information. And now this is very hard to do. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some of the impacts on ethics when we, we talk about this. But I think that that kind of dialectic is a really important one. Enough information, not too much information, but enough information to also allow me to make the right decision. Now, uh, when we talk about abstractions, we really have to go into conversational patterns. And so that's, that's what we'll dive into right now. So the first one is really just what a regular chat is. And if it wasn't clear, um, our chatbot has been named Amelia, and I, I definitely appreciate the UN study that just came out about a week ago. Um, so it was a decision that was made before I got there. Um, but at the same time, there are pros and cons about personification. There are pros and cons about uh, gender gen you know, making a bot have a gender. You'll notice, though, that I refer to it as it rather than she, um, and I think that's appropriate in this case. So anyways, uh, regular chat is really about the customer, the employee, or some person that needs to interact with that chatbot. Um, I've included two other parties here that are going to be really important in other conversational patterns, such as a customer support agent who is really the human being that is going to be uh, involved in some way eventually, and then a subject matter expert who helps set policy. Um, in the classical sense, when we talk about automation, um, these would be referred to as the, uh, Amelia as the operator, uh, the customer support person as another operator, and then the subject matter expert is really the designer um, and maybe the manager. A whisper agent is something that's kind of interesting in the sense that a lot of the people that we work with at IPsoft uh, have 
legacy and antiquated systems, or they have systems that have been you know, built over time in like a lava flow, where you have additive things over time. And sometimes it's easier to buy something or use a solution that maps over those to create something simpler. And so in the case of a whisper agent, the, the customer is still talking directly with a human being, but that human being are, is using tools that could be you know, websites or applications, but could also be an agent that in some way could respond to those inquiries. So an example of this is we've worked with, uh, you know, again, an insurance example, is a lot of these agents will get the question, why did my bill go up this last month? And it's a very complicated thing when we talk about underwriting. And so um, what they had previously done is they'd look at three or four different screens across these apps that had been built five or 10 years ago. They would have to use the, do the cognition themselves, and about one out of three times they would get it wrong. So we built an agent that would actually look at that information, create a short list, and then an explainable way to talk about that with the customer to remove the cognitive overhead and allow them to really be person to person with them. So that's an example of a whisper agent. Group chat is one that um, I really love and I think we're gonna be using this a lot more in the long term. It's not something that's used as much. But the idea of all of these different parties being together in a group chat to be able to solve some type of problem. Um, and so the example that I'll give around this is something that my previous, uh, my previous work was at a design consultancy. And we were working with Google and PwC to, uh, in this particular case, the vertical around um, basically field service operations. So you have a field tech that's going out to repair something. It's like an AC or like a gas station in our case where you can't pick it up and then return it to the person that you bought it from. You have to go on site to actually fix it. And there's a lot of different people involved. There's dispatchers, there's warehouse people, there's parts runners, there's experts. And they all need to get together to talk about what is the right way to fix a particular problem. And so in this case, the left-hand side is the information about the job that is being assigned or potentially assigned. And then the right-hand side is a group chat. In our case, we uh, called it Patrick. Um, so again, you know, something that, that you should think about, like how often people try to do this personification. Um, but Patrick would take the action of not only trying to provide valid information, so like, hey, there were other jobs that were like this, but it would also add people when it felt like they had expertise, and then would basically allow them to be released from this conversation, or, or would, would say, You're, you don't have to worry about this anymore and mute everything, based on how Patrick considered the flow of the job happening. The next one is escalation. And this is really, really important, as was brought up in a question. Escalation is key to these types of systems. And so that's where a customer and the agent are talking, but for whatever reason, either the agent can't understand it, um, or the fact that the agent should not be taking action in some way. And so there are a lot of cases where you need to actually have a human being where they are taking some action so that there's accountability. And I'll talk about accountability later. Um, but that's, that's really key to escalation. And then finally, learning is this idea that as you see escalations or an abandonment of these types of conversations, how does a subject matter expert update and maintain the system so that as time goes on, it's actually up, it's, it's understanding things better and better. So that's interpretability. Um, not a small subject. I kind of rushed through it, but uh, happy to answer more questions about that. The next thing is really around trust. Um, and so trust is, is really, really important. Um, something that we use as human beings as a starting point for how we should interact with each other. It's very cultural. It's very much based on how we've, uh, you know, all of our, again, all of our context and all of our experiences up to this point imply how we will b actually use trust within a conversation. Now, this is a paper um, that was in 97 by Paris Suriman, who is kind of a superstar in the automation and trust uh, kind of segment. Um, and this paper really, for me, I think outlined some important concepts around trust. And it was about this idea that you're breaking trust into a couple different segments or, or places where you'll be in this, in this kind of space of trust. And it's use, misuse, disuse, and abuse, and I'll talk about what that means. Um, but effectively, it's that you either trust things the right amount, you trust them too much, you trust them too little, or you actually don't care about the person at all and you're doing something that's not good for them, which means that they will inherently distrust you. Um, so there's like a space of trust that you should think about. And when you're building these systems, it's really key uh, to do that. So use is the voluntary activation or disengagement of automation by human operators. So that means that when I'm interacting with an automation, I'm using it as appropriate, and I'm using it to do a task that is appropriate for that automation, for that context. Um, so here's an example of what we would do, say, with a conversational agent. So hi, I'm an IT virtual agent. How can I help you? I'm locked out of my account. Now, 
point is here is that we're understanding context. The conversational agent is really understanding the exact thing that needs to happen based on context, and that could be behavioral or profile. And then it's responding, and it's taking action. So I see you tried to log in a few times without success. I can unlock your account, but need to verify a few pieces of information first. Right? So that's, that's appropriate. This is a appropriate request. Well, actually, it's not even a request, but it's, it has an intent behind it, which is I have a request that I need help. Um, and then it is taking the appropriate action for this case. The next thing is misuse, which is over-reliance on automation. Um, and that can result in failures uh, where the person may not understand that there is a failure taking place or certain types of decision biases. And so this is some work by uh, Dr. Iona Howard out of Georgia Tech. And uh, they basically manufactured a, uh, a research study where people would be filling out some forms and then suddenly they would simulate an emergency. And so they had f like smoke in the hallway, they had the emergency lights going off. And then the person would walk out into the hallway from their, ta their, their fake task, and they would see this robot. And the robot would then, you know, it said, like, emergency, follow me. It had the lights on the top. And uh, some cases, they would just see whether it would follow it to the correct place. In other cases, they would just have it go into a room and go around in circles. Um, and people, a majority of the time, would just follow this robot. Because if there's a robot here, it's got to be smart. It's got to be able to do the right thing in this case even when there's an exit sign that is literally within the same field of view of that, of that robot. And so this is a case where people overtrust technologies or certain types of technologies in certain cases. So in this example, it probably would have been more effective to actually have you know, um, just a, an actual PA announcement about the type of emergency, lights on the ground, a very blaring alarm, you know, things like that that would have caused people to take action because that's the issue. You want, during emergencies, people to take action rather than just do what they're supposed to, right? Um, so that's an interesting example. I'm talking about chat. Um, the idea is that, uh, you know, this agent is not making it clear enough to understand that I'm really just here to do things with IT, right? So, it's at, so this person is asking about, I want to book a flight. And so then um, to adjust this trust now is it's giving a very, um, you know, it's giving a direct answer, and then it's trying to help them in some way. So that's really, really important. Um, the other thing I would say is that, you know, in this case, uh, things like my friend just passed out and isn't breathing is probably not something that most chatbots are actually trained on um, or conversational agents are trained on. And so this is an, a, a very important example of how are you now belaying the right level of trust that this person should have? How are you adjusting it over time? So this is, this is a misuse of this technology. Next thing is disuse, which is neglect or underutilization. So basically, I don't trust this system, so I'm not going to use it when I really should. Um, and there are two ways that this happens with conversational agents. Uh, oh, actually, before I talk about that, what's really key here is that I don't know if anybody's had the unfortunate um, need to be in an ICU, but there are an incredible number of machines that are there monitoring people, and the beeps are going off all the time, and then nurses or nurse practitioners or doctors are coming in and just shutting them off without even looking at them. And the reason why is because they get thousands of alerts per day per room. And so they've just learned to just not trust the technology in the way that they should anymore. Um, so this is what disuse is. Um, the ways that I've seen this is that uh, people don't trust conversational agents, right? Um, and so conversational agents, because of the, how bad they were maybe a couple years ago, everybody has this preconceived notion about the, how they operate. And so there is a real issue that people will try to trigger um, escalations. We're trying to come up with the right kind of cool term for that. Um, I'm thinking more like NLP triggering or fishing for humans or something like that. Um, but I'm not sure what it is yet. But um, in this case, people will just say gibberish to chat uh, agents sometimes because they just don't want to deal with them. Um, and then the one that we're probably most familiar with is really just whenever you hear an IVR system and you yell operator until it finally gives up and gives you a human being. So that's misuse. Or, sorry, dis that's disuse based on distrust. Um, and then finally, abuse is really this automation of a function without due regard for the consequences of human performance. And while I think you know, this doesn't necessarily fit in the idea of this is a one-dimensional spectrum of kind of under-trust versus over-trust and the right amount of trust, it's a really important one because this actually is something many, many people have not taken into account when building systems previously. Um, and so essentially, it's your, if you're doing something like design thinking, you just cut out the empathize step and you just do things, essentially. Um, so I, I just always like to bring this up, that this is, this is a really key aspect of it. Um, and so an example would be something like, you know, I need help getting approval on my expense report. And the example is really, you know, well, it's too bad, it's over the policy, um, and you need to go figure it out, 
basically. Um, that's the case of abuse. You're not actually helping someone in this case. So these are things that you need to be cognizant of when you're creating these types of agents. And then how do we build trust? Um, I've been thinking about trust because, uh, you know, there's a bunch of um, examples I've seen in the literature where they try to create these very complicated box and arrow diagrams of what trust is or how it gets built or what, it act what the components of it are. But I, I think it comes down to a very simple thing, is that there's some minimum bar that people have expectations for, and it's, you know, it is different across people. It is different for different situations. But when you're building these things, you should be understanding that. And there's some minimum bar by which if you do things below that bar, so there's no communication, doesn't allow intervention, that you're going to be losing trust over time. And then there's things that are above this. So how are you being interpretable? How are you allowing expertise to be built on top of the system? How do you help humans avoid errors rather than just let them make them? Where you are actually building trust. So while this is very squishy and kind of subjective, um, that's because it involves humans, unfortunately. Unfortunately, unfortunately. And that's trust. Uh, the last part I want to go into, and then um, it's, it's a pretty wide topic, and so uh, the way I wanted to approach this is really a review of recent issues around ethics when it comes to not only AI, but also conversational interfaces, and then a little bit about how I look at the practice of these things and why practice is actually, I think, more important than having something like super strict codes of ethics. Um, so the first one is that let's pretend that this car, this white car right here, was an autonomous vehicle. And so it has not gotten into an accident yet. All right, good. It made, it made the exit. Um, now, what this points to is something that's very important, is that these systems will not always be having... Like, there was in some way an action that this, say, autonomous vehicle would have taken that caused two different accidents and could have actually caused a lot of harm. Um, but the issue is, is that it didn't, it wasn't involved with it in the end, right? Um, and so, you know, there's a really great paper here about moral crumple zones. And so what could have happened if we didn't have that video, for example, is that those two truckers could have actually gotten in trouble because if it's an autonomous vehicle, it must be operating within some parameters that it's been tested to. But those humans, those humans are the problem. And so this is an amazing paper called Moral Crumple Zones, which is about the idea that generally anybody that is human, when we talk about systems or we talk about the mixing of humans and systems, it's usually the humans that are blamed. Um, and it's usually because we believe we all have agency, that we are the ones that are making these bad decisions in some way. And the next thing I want to talk about is, this is, uh, this is actually not recent, but the Thorak 25 was a uh, radiology machine um, that ended up killing a couple of people. And the reason why was that there was a hardware change uh, for a, a locking mechanism. There was a software change that caused a bug. And then there were bad error messages that were being displayed to the operators. And even though the operators could hear people, in some cases, screaming in pain um, by getting radiology treatments, they continued to give them because the system said it was not giving it to them. So this is an example of like, out of all these different people that were involved in this particular case, whose fault is it? And who is accountable for these decisions? And as we talk about the future of these types of machine learning systems, as they get more and more integrated with system, other systems, once there's more in, you know, dependence between all of these systems, one small impact can have a huge one on an individual. And so how do we start to understand that? And accountability is one of these things that I think uh, Joanna Bryson from University of Bath is also, this is, this is not her paper, but this is another great paper, but talks about it, you know, there are regulatory bodies that already exist to do regulation of these things. We just need to also apply them to these systems. Um, and when we talk about accountability, it gets even harder because there's going to be more and more people that are going to be implementing these systems. So how do we do that? And that's a very hard question. Um, another thing that I would bring up, this is a, uh, po an article from The Verge, which was about um, beneficiaries for um, basically uh, Medicare, Medicaid benefits. And so one year, it was caseworkers that would provide them with the number of hours that they would get, um, say, for cerebral palsy and assistance at home. The next year, it was an expert system. And they would get less, some people would get less hours. And to disagree with that, the caseworker couldn't disagree, the beneficiary couldn't disagree. They had to take it to the state Supreme Court to bring those companies to trial, which they then said in the end that, you know, there was a mistake. Somehow the wrong calculation was being used. So there's no way for a regular person to disagree and just say, no, <laughs> this is not right in some way. Um, so that's bad, right? How do you allow for more agency or escalation in these systems? This is a book called Ghost Work, um, and there's a great 
uh, talk at the Data and Society Group uh, website about this, but it's by Mary Gray. And what she talks about is this, this idea that when, in reality, AI, machine learning, all these things are so dependent on data that a lot of the time it's actually people doing this. So Mechanical Turk, uh, Figure 8, all of these systems are actually people doing this work. And if we think about this, even extending it to the point that um, a lot of people think about Uber or Lyft as autonomous vehicles already. They don't want to interact with their drivers, right? I think even in Juno, there's a flag that you can set to just like, leave me alone and don't talk to me, right? So the idea of ghost work, these people are gig economy workers. This is gonna become a bigger and bigger part of our world everywhere. And so how do we understand, how do we involve them in the agency of these types of systems as well? And I think this is, gets down to a, maybe a system boundary issue that in reality, what we're drawing the system boundary around is usually the company and the customer, but there's many, many other people like contractors to that company, people that are impacted in second or third orders. And so we're not drawing the system boundary correctly. So how do we draw that better? Um, I did write a piece about the ethics and morals of Google Duplex, which is really, really amazing and interesting technology. Um, the problem is effectively that not every restaurant can afford to use something like, say, OpenTable, right? Um, or do they want to? And so the, then the question becomes for the consumer, because they're being in some way inconvenienced by not being able to use a system like that, are they morally, is it morally acceptable or ethically okay for them to then use a system that disregards the restaurant's um, actual desires in some way, and, but does it for the consumer? So it's a very hard question. If you want to read it, I, I could, uh, I'll be providing all the links to this afterwards. Um, but it's not straightforward, and it's not, it's not black and white in this case. Um, and maybe in the end, you know, the truth is, is that restaurants are still opting out in some way, right? So they're ignoring calls, or they're seeing them as like spam or something like that. Um, in California, there is actually a law in the books to require identification of chat agents if they're, if they're calling. Um, the next thing that I think is really important is this concept of intersectionality. Right, so if people are not familiar, it's uh, I think originated from like feminist studies, but really there's a great uh, talk by uh, Google and Jigsaw at the O'Reilly AI conference earlier this year, talking about um, how the idea of, it's not, the idea of say just race or just education or just class or any of these individual things, there are gonna be problems when we talk about accuracy of these systems, like bias. Um, the idea of there are gender differences in accuracy of recognition of speech, for example. Um, Scottish people are definitely given the bad, bad part of this. Um, but intersectionality is really interesting when we talk about accuracy of any of these types of systems. And in particular with toxicity, there's a really great paper where they, they look at the fact that for individual terms, when trying to identify toxicity, they would use terms that were LGBT or terms that were about ethnicity or race and would then overclassify it as toxic even though it shouldn't be. And so that was something that they then had to fix in version one, right? The next thing, in the, actually on the right-hand side, basically more purple is worse uh, when it comes to identifying as toxic. But it gets even worse when we talk about the intersectionality between race and LGBT status, for example. And so um, we need to think about this more and more. Even though we'll get up to things like accuracy of 99 point something percent, there's still that other side. And I think there's, the question is, how do we do this better from the standpoint of like physicians, right? Physicians, as a general practitioner, will handle the majority case, but then there are specialists that help handle other cases. And I, I wonder, how do we do this better to be able to handle the, the right cases for everybody, not just the majority? Um, and then the last thing I wanna bring up is this is a really, really great uh, piece about AI ethics, and in particular, seven traps that I think a lot of people fall into. And the one I wanna just talk about right now is really the fifth trap, which is the dichotomy trap. And maybe this is what has driven me to be more focused on practice than codes, um, and that is because there's no ethical endpoint, right? It's not like suddenly I'll be certified as ethical and then I never have to do any work again. We are constantly having to reassess how our ethics or morals or decisions are being brought to bear on the people that we're impacting with this technology. So how do we practice ethics, right? That's a very, very hard question. I don't have all the answers, um, but I wanna leave you with something that is maybe not a code of ethics. Um, because again, I think there are cultural differences. Every country may have a different interpretation of what ethics will be. Um, I think the one that I tend to use and the one that we're trying to look at within IPsoft um, is really around questions and mindsets. And I think questions and mindsets are really helpful for this. 
So the set of questions that I think are good heuristics to use when, when looking at this is one, what if they could opt out, right? What if you were penalized for them opting out of your system? What would that mean? And that means in a case of conversational agents, escalation. So having the ripcord available is a very big button that says, hey, you can operate with this conversational agent, but if you don't like it, you don't feel like it, whatever, you can press this button, you will get a human being immediately. And the human being is way more expensive than what the conversational agent is. How do we answer for our own decisions? How do we build accountability within our organizations so that it's not just, oh, this was the environment that, hap that, that made this happen? Um, how is it that we understand things like training of intent models, business process creation? Um, how do we understand that better? Are we leaving anybody out? So when we talk about who we're actually uh, you know, building this for, are there other people that will be impacted by what we do? And then finally, how are we learning and fixing things? Right? These are not things that you build once and then they're done. You constantly have to iterate on them. You're gonna be constantly learning about what is good or bad. And then as a set of mindsets that I keep in mind, um, one is the veil of ignorance with p if people are not familiar. It's basically, if you were to just randomly put yourself in anybody else's shoes, what would that mean for the policy you're trying to decide right now? So if I had to not be, say, the designer of these systems, but I had to be a person that was sitting there um, in that, using that system, what would that mean? Nothing about us without us. Um, is a term from kind of mid-Europe uh, policy, uh, sorry, like governance within the 1500s. Um, and I love this one because it's really about if you're not including people that are gonna be impacted in your design process, you're not doing the right thing, basically. Um, adversarial thinking, this is one that I'm really, really interested in, but you know, basically we have a lot of assumptions or biases that we don't know about. And that's because the worst bias is really the blind spot bias. And that's the one we don't know, but we have biases. So adversarial thinking is how do you include people, you know, uh, the Israelis talk about it from the standpoint of contrarian thinking, right? The devil's advocate from the Catholic days, uh, like in the, the would be, always be this person that would try to come up with reasons not to ordain someone. Um, and so adversarial thinking is really, really key because it helps you get out of the bad assumptions you may have. And then the most impactful way to even get past that is that even the people that are your adversarial thinkers will still in some ways have biases. And so I use something like randomness. And so I can talk about this later, but there are like decks of cards, things that I use to, they're not necessarily checklists for decision making, but because there's lots of questions you'd wanna ask. But if you can't ask say 100 questions on a checklist, how can you pick five of those at random and then use them to better inform your perception of the world? Um, so that's really important. And so what does ethics have to do with these conversational agents? And I'll just leave it very quickly that, you know, technology are basically tools that we've been creating since the beginning of time. And is this an ax? Is this a trowel for farming? It could be either, right? Is this a, is this a weapon that, we, that someone could use in war? And we've changed what our weapons look like. And we've changed what our tools look like. But in the end, it's just us behind this curtain. <laughs> Right? We build tools for ourselves. We build tools based on ourselves, and we build tools for other people. Um, so I would just say thank you, and uh, you know, in the end, how do you do that? How do you pull back that curtain? So, yeah, and then, yeah Q&A. <laughs> thank you. So we'll, uh, we'll open for, for questions for Chris right now, and then uh, later on, uh, around 12 o'clock, we'll finish, but there'll be another half hour to just have conversations with uh, whoever you want in the room. So uh, please, questions for Chris. Uh, in your ethics question, yeah. valid. how does that compare with what we're using to create the alternative? So I, I think the data that we've seen, so there is still bias in all the things we do when it comes to tools, right? They're, they're, and to be fair, I guess I wanna make the differentiation between bias, prejudice, and discrimination as well, right? There's good and bad bias. And generally, when we talk about conversational agents, there's still the bias of what the organization needs to get done. And when we talk about the idea of, sh of maximizing shareholder value, that's not always in the realm of bias that's good for humanity. Right, um, so yeah, th there's, this, is, this is a topic that is something that we're trying to build that practice internal to our organization. I think a lot of other organizations like Google, 
uh, with Pear, and then I think Facebook has another one. There's a couple different, like, again, unfortunately, those are the people <laughs> that probably, they need the ethics organization, but how well is it going to work for them is a real question. Um, so I guess, uh, yeah, from the standpoint of are there biases in these technologies, there absolutely are. And it, it comes down to the fact that when we're training this with human information, so the idea of utterances that we've collected from, say, customer support transcripts, there is bias in those things, especially in how, like, the even the customer agent may interact with someone. And so, you know, there's like a joke from this, a bunch of board members of Verizon, you know, they had a real issue with customer support, and so they used the joke that if you don't like the answer you get from customer support when you call in, just call back. Because you're going to get a different answer, <laughs> basically. Um, so there's a lot of like biases and irregularity in the way that human beings deal with things. Um, I do think that you know, we're probably going to be more aware of these biases when we talk about the agents, but how do you understand when there is a bias against someone? And that is a really hard thing, unless you provide these types of mechanisms. And so again, escalation, being able to walk away, being able to opt out, those are things that I think when we, you know, it feels like agency is maybe a core of these types of ethical principles. Um, and, you know, Microsoft also has like a really great edX course if you want to look into more about like ethics and data. Um, but I, I just don't think that there's like, there's no one way to do this. And so we have to make decisions. And from my standpoint, I tend to be so involved in the practice of doing this stuff that it's like, how do I, how do I keep this top of mind as I'm making decisions overall? Um, now, how do you link that with overall strategy is a completely different thing, right? When we talk about from the business world, we talk about how do you link that with kind of, I guess, strategy from a policy standpoint, that's another thing as well. And I'm definitely not an expert in that. Um, yeah, sorry, I, I don't know if I'm answering your question. It's a very, very hard topic to, to try to get at. But for me, it's about practice and about how am I doing this on a day-to-day -day basis, personally. Um, is there a follow-up? I, I want to make sure that I'm... No, it's just, it's just funny because a lot of the examples you give <laughs> oh, yeah. Males from North America, Fair enough. white male. I mean, that's yeah, yeah. obviously kind of, I think, something that comes into conscious now when people talk, but it is, yeah. you know, it's a, it's a curious question because I'm like, if those are all the people who sit in the room, already you've, you've left out, I mean, we're a little different in this organization in that we have that, but sometimes when yeah. you still look at who makes decisions or where everyone ultimately yeah. sits, you know, hierarchically, you could probably draw many different kinds of interesting maps. So I think, you know, it, it starts like, yes, it's difficult, but Everybody sound, not American, but does everyone sound American? Or and I'm Californian, you know? so I feel like I have the most yeah. neutral accent out of anybody. So, so. <laughs> so I think you know it starts with those kinds yeah, of right. things. With if all of this is being built by what seems like a yeah. fairly homogenous, totally right. population, you've already started in a certain bias corner. No, you're absolutely right, and I think this is why diversity and inclusion, while you know, works in some places and is maybe more just like as a title in other places. I think that's a key aspect of this. Um, but I do think that, you know, I guess as a, you know, white male in this, uh, which I am, right? Like, I, I don't think it's, it's fairly clear. Um, you know, how do we, how are we allies to providing that type of context is really, really important. And so, again, it's not going to be perfect, but I think we need to start moving. I mean, again, we need to be continuously moving in that direction, and it's never going to be perfect. There's always going to be new intersectionalities that we have to worry about or that we were not aware of previously. Um, and so, anyways, it's, it's a start, but it's not the end. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned sentiment analysis, and yeah. it was very interesting because it's just so complex. Yeah. I mean, you're trying to do social media sentiment analysis, and there's a post like, I love donuts, but donuts are so bad for you. And you just don't know, is it negative, positive, neutral? Um, my question was that, have you looked at um, facial recognition algorithms to yeah. just look at these emotions? Because I was looking at this company in New Zealand called Soul Machines that have these digital characters that actually look at your face mm -hmm. and they smile with you and there's kind of like, the demo is quite interesting yeah. because there's some sort of like empathy in it and it looks at the facial um, algorithms and see how, if you're happy, if you're upset, if your eyebrows are going up, if you have a question in your face. So, I mean, I understand some people are extremely poker face, but, <laughs> and you can't really tell their facial expressions, but I was wondering if that's something yeah. that you're looking into. Yeah, so we, we are definitely looking into it. Um, I used to work for a company um, out of Hong Kong that invested in a group called Effectiva. And so Effectiva is based out of Boston, and they uh, are a spin out from the MIT Media Lab run by Rana. And so she 
you know, basically, she has done a lot around the science of facial analysis um, to do that. Now, there are biases, so they do a very poor job with faces that are from uh, Eastern Asia, for example. Um, but, you know, so there's, a, there's definitely a bias issue around this, and there's a cultural issue around this as well, because different expressions mean different things. Even, even like the idea of like just using your hands in a conversation and how you tilt your head and everything, it's very, very interesting. But, but yeah, so that definitely gets you further along, right? Because body language is, is high context for us. It's the way that we actually, uh, you know, 90% of our conversations are actually that. So I think that's it's gonna be helpful longer term. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I just, it, it's one of those things where, especially in, say, a business context, sometimes people may be agitated for some reason that is not because of what they're asking for. Um, and so do, does it make you feel better? You know, we, like, in, in our case, the system has many, many different modules that are used as an ensemble together to provide responses. And so some of those responses do try to understand, uh, you know, kind of, the emotional context of the comment and then respond with either sympathy or something else, right? And so, I don't know, I mean, do you, would you feel like you were connecting more with the machine if it, if it said something that it didn't feel but it was trying to be sympathetic or mirror your feelings? I'm not sure. And there's a lot of studies that talk about this. I just, I, in practice, I just still hasn't, I haven't seen it really used in a way that is really, really valuable. Like, we default to the, um, the concept of if like, you know, basically if you ever want to feign anger in a conversation, you just use all caps, right? <laughs> or, I mean, there's a generational thing about that too, but like, if you just put all caps, people are gonna think you're angry, right? And, and it's just the way the internet works today. And so our agent, like, the best way to have it trigger an escalation is just use all caps a bunch. Um, and because we do have that system. Now, um, you know, there are other things that are more subtle around emotion that we've been trying to think about that maybe you need to prioritize people that are angrier, right? Um, to try to reduce the amount of time that they're ang angry. Maybe you need to change the person that they're escalated to based on how well that person is able to be compassionate or something else. So there's, there's, there's definitely possibilities here, but there's a lot of, just a lot of problems with it still um, based on what I can see. Yeah, but facial analysis is really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I mean the question, the comment you made about like anger and just getting better service when you're angry, and I thought that, I mean, I just want to pick up your brain on this, yeah. on the issue of human beings starting faking their emotions <laughs> yeah. or their persona because they know that, I mean, they might get different services. I mean, I was reading that now U.S. Yes. is actually looking at every individual social media accounts yeah. when they want to grant them visa, and it's already in place. Yeah. So everyone who wants to apply for U.S. visa have to write down their social media from Instagram to Twitter to it's YouTube insane. for the last five years. Yeah. So that would then turn users into some sort of a, they would create perhaps some sort of a fake. Yeah. Uh, well, people already do. I mean, that's Instagram. Media. Exactly, <laughs> <Right>. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And I'm wondering if, I mean, this is going to create some sort of a, like a yeah. human yeah. beings creating fake personas of yes. themselves and not being real anymore. Well, yeah, and I, I think this is an issue that, you know, we were, a bunch of people, you know, we were people that were living in villages of tens to hundreds of people, and that was okay. Like, we could figure out how to, like, what performative things we needed to do to fit in, right? And it was all very specific to that. But now that we're a village of, like, seven billion people, um, that's really, really hard to figure out. Um, I do hope that, I, I don't know, maybe the future of these types of conversational agents are really more about the agentive technology as a way that it protects you online, right? Rather than the idea of the machine working for a corporation somewhere. So I think there's something interesting there. Now, the, there's a lot of other things we need to figure out, like how do, you, how do you make sure that how you get this thing is never going to be beholden to someone else, right? Like the issue that we will see with things like duplex, the big question is that when, you, when I say I want to make a, a hair appointment somewhere, I want to make a restaurant reservation, how does it decide which restaurant to call if I don't specify it? Right? And how does it also tell me what it's doing in those cases? So there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff. I, again, it's probably, it's, it's out of depth of this talk, I think, because it's really more about like, how do we operate as a community that's global now? And how do we operate in a way where there's going to be people that, you know, are not, maybe they want harm. So maybe like another mindset is the idea of how, how are you, um, you know, intolerance of intolerance, right? Like, what does that mean? Um, and so 
where's the line on that? How do you allow for conversation of, of things that are really hard to talk about? Um, I do worry, though, from a learning perspective, there's uh, an analogy for this in surgery where I think in every US state now, there's a law in the books that uh, for certain systems in the medical community that if you put notes in there, it's not legally admissible. And the reason why is that um, when someone screws up in a medical sense, or maybe they make the wrong decision, not even screws up, they just make the wrong decision, and they bet on something that was wrong, right? There was, they took a risk that was gonna help. Um, they can then be sued, um, at least they previously could be. And you end up having situations when it comes to resiliency within risky situations that if you don't allow for real conversations to take place, you can never fix it. And that's actually places where it's like the zero, you know, 10 days since the last accident types of places end up being zero tolerance for mistakes. And that's where you then have catastrophic issues that come around. And so, um, you know, there's, there's some doctors and groups that will do post-mortems where they have a weekly meeting. It's legally secured from the standpoint that no one can be sued from that meeting. And they have a real discussion about how to change things that they did. So I don't know. That's, that's one thing. I wonder how we start to get to that point when it comes to policy, when it comes to discussions like this as well. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Any other questions? <clears throat> Hi, Mong Kong again. Um, thank you very much for your talk, uh, presentation. Uh, it's very informative. I don't know if you're aware about EOS.io that they announced recently, a few days ago, uh -huh. that they're going to be the only, I mean, the first social network called Voice that will store, they will use blockchain technology to, to behind yeah. the yeah. social network. It means everything will be stored on blockchain. Yeah, yeah it's interesting. I mean. The thing about blockchain, and maybe I'm, too, maybe I'm too much of a skeptic or a contrarian when it comes to this type of stuff, but you know, it's just until the next big fork that you get the security that you want, right? Like, I mean, there are plenty of times where, um, like, to, maybe let's put it this way. Blockchains are the type of thing that people are like, this is the way the world will work until the too big to fail moment happens. And if you're not familiar with what that means in the US, it's that you know, bailing out of large banks that we can't let this fail. But the truth is, is that um, blockchains are these things that you know, maybe we all want to agree that they make sense right now, but there's probably some circumstance where we will decide that it no longer makes sense anymore. And so that's my concern about blockchain technologies, is that there's still humans that are involved. Right? We're still making decisions. We're still saying whether we believe in this or not. Like even, even the whole idea about like throwing away the idea of fiat currency, like you have to change a lot of people's minds about what value is in these types of situations for it to work out. Uh, it doesn't mean that blockchain is, or say Bitcoin or something like that is not going to you know, create the right type of situation for people to still use it as a currency, but it's very volatile too. So I don't know, those are a couple of thoughts. Again, the hype beast that I'm, I'm mostly concerned with is AI and machine learning, but I've done some consulting in blockchain previously, and I don't know. Yeah, just to, just to talk about that. Um, again, I think it's to do Can similar to- Turn on your mic. I think it's similar to AI, it's how you design it. Um, so a lot of people think that they can just dump stuff on the blockchain. And as Chris rightly said, it's only secure as your next fork. But you should use blockchain or, or design applications correctly to use blockchain as a kind of running in parallel kind of verification mechanism. That's it. It should be a reference pointer to verify data. That's it. But I think there's a lot of misconceptions, quite rightly yeah. so, and there's a lot of uh, bad connotations around cryptocurrencies and everything that goes with that. But I believe personally that if... I don't. I think blockchain is the first iteration. There's actually something else called a DAG, a, a directed a solid graph, which is the kind of next iteration of that. Um, and I think that this will transform the way that we verify information across the globe. But I think it's it does come down to a lot of design yeah. problems, which haven't been with most of these emerging technologies that haven't been identified correctly yet. And maybe to just add a little bit more to that too, right? I think when we talk about blockchain technology. There's, there's a concern about the lack of identity in certain communities, um, especially, you know, where... So you want identity in some cases, right? You want to be able to have reputation. You want to be able to trust people online. But also you need certain cases uh, anonymity when it comes to the idea of speaking out about things, right? And so uh, this is maybe related to the idea of breaking a law right now that in the future is no longer going to be a law. Like, how do you deal with that? 
And, and so that's why being anonymous online, but still potentially having the ability to take on identity is really key. But there's a spectrum of how you want to do that um, and, and what's needed when it comes to things like, um, yeah, I, I don't know. It's a very complicated t topic as well, but I, I think it's, it's very interesting. It's just that, like, where, what case is this helping solve in comparison to something like, you know, the, the depths of, like, 4chan and the horrible parts of the internet where anonymity and kind of that idea does create maybe, maybe the right word is interesting things, maybe not great things all the time. But then there's the idea of having too much identity means that you can never try anything um, that is potentially, again, breaking that law in the future that will not be a law. And so I don't know. There's, it's a very, very complicated subject. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Hello. Um, thank you so much for this presentation. It was wonderful. My question is directed towards Chris. And I wanted to know if you could please speak a bit more on the importance of considering intersectionality when creating AI systems. Yeah. Um, and also your personal thoughts on what you think are some good suggestions, recommendations yeah. going forward about how we can implement such considerations. Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely not an expert on this. And there's a great paper um, by Google that I'll link to in my slides that can be available afterwards That'd that talks great. about this, where it's really like the idea of a like a report card for these, these types of things. Um, you know, and again, my intersectionality is not that interesting when it comes to tech people. But uh, what I would say is that, um, one, you need to be including teams that have diverse mindsets. And that includes a lot of different things. Um, because I think everybody kind of looks at it from their own intersectionality, right? And, that, and they tend to interpret things through that. Um, the level outside of your team, because you can't have like a team of a million people, right? Like it's just not, it's, you, things break down past about five or 10 and you start to get into different hierarchical and bureaucracy type of issues. But then after that, it's how do you go out and talk to the people that will not only be using your system but be impacted by it, right? So, so using that from a qualitative research standpoint I think is very, very important. Um, and then finally, you know, I think randomness is another one of those. So like I think there's, an interesting idea around how would, like when you look at the data, say, say you have an algorithm that is doing classification or is doing prediction or something like that, how are you looking at the space of possible answers to see where the problems could be? And there's two ways you can go about that, right? Like you can do exploration of a space. And so there's lots of groups that do this idea. And when I say space, I mean like if you consider each like a multi-dimensional data space as like one being race, one being sex, one being whatever, right? Mm -hmm. All those different things. Um, and how do you explore that space to understand where your algorithm edges are, right? Like where does it change in classification or um, something like that? And then finally, when you talk about like how do you how do you start to generate these types of profiles or personas in a way that is more random to do a better search, but in a way that's very directed? So I think there's, there's going to be better and better tools around that in the future. There are a lot of tools right now that will use something that's referred to as kind of adversarial models to say, if you train a model on one data set and you train another model on another data set, if you can tell which piece of data came from which model, there's some bias in that model, that data set in some way. And so there's more and more techniques. IBM is working on this. Microsoft's working on this. Google's working on this. So they're trying to come up with toolkits to be able to do a better job of identifying bias in this data as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, that, that's a starting point. But I always am worried about, like, the outcome that, that's going to happen based on this thing. And so we've, we've also been doing a technique called confusion mapping where we basically bring a group of people together to brainstorm the worst possible cases. Um, and then stack rank those based on severity and impact. And so from there, if you understand that a little bit more, you can start to decide whether you need an ensemble of models rather than just one model. Do you need to have certain types of hard-coded or more deterministic processes to avoid things? Like regulatory compliance is one that should be very deterministic. Right. Right, yeah. So those are some thoughts I have about that. But. Thank you so much. Yeah, OK, we'll take one more question. Uh, so, uh, chat box. Well, yeah, so you mean, like, uh, can, can you get a chatbot to transfer someone else's funds into your account or something like that? Um, yeah. So I'm sure there will be cases of all of this in the future, 
Um, I think that's the only thing I am sure of. Now, how it happens and how it works is in going to be incredibly interesting um, because you know we don't build things where um, I can ask you, I, I can ask the bot unless I'm impersonating someone else, right? Or I have their login credentials. So what I'd say is that generally there's going to be other places that are higher value targets within an attack surface that people will go after to do these types of things. Um, but we protect against a lot of the basics around, say, like SQL injection, cross-site scripting, that type of stuff. So. Yeah, anyways, I think there's always gonna be a case of something like that, but I think a lot of these systems are built so that the system is not self-learning. Maybe that's one good distinction to make, is that um, you know, we don't build systems that are purely self-learning because it's, it's not actually what businesses want. Just because you ask about something over and over again doesn't mean that they should handle it, right? Um, so what we do is we do try to make sure that we're operating within all of the cases that make sense for an actual bot to take on, um, but maybe in those escalations, I think it's possibly more likely where there's impersonation in those cases that it could happen to, but. And so what happens if a trained model that data gets for a particular? Yeah, I mean, there's some, there's some issues around privacy, around how being able to back into, say, original details of a data set based on a model, and so there are a lot of techniques for doing that. But in our cases, the utterances, in some cases are from live transcripts, but usually with obfuscation of the actual personal PII data. So we, like if someone, like for example, maybe you want to detect that there's um, something like social security numbers being published inside your chat logs, right? Um, you want, because you want to block them or you want to obscure them. Um, the truth is, is that you could train it with a bunch of people's social security numbers, but you could also probably just have it look for things that are of the pattern, three digits, two digits, four digits. Um, and there are gonna be problems with that type of heuristic. So anyways, th 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 the idea of security in any of these cases is not simplistic because it's a system um, that has many components and many modules and many ways to access. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm sure that there will be a case that in some way someone uses a chatbot to have something terrible happen. I'm pretty sure that will be the case. It's like when and how is, is the, the real question. And I can't tell you that because we take all the precautions we can. <laughs> take the last question sure. myself. Uh, I, I, uh, something that, that struck me when you talked about Google Duplex and th that to me there's a fundamental difference between the, uh, the chatbots that we decide to converse with mm. uh, that you call up and then a yeah. bot talks back to you and, and the Google Duplex idea where the bot takes <coughs> the initiatives and, and, and calls you up. Do you foresee a, a future where we'll be sitting in our desks and uh, suddenly the, the bot on my desk, or maybe on my phone yeah. or something, the phone rings and a bot says, hey, it seems you seem to be having a lot of trouble with MS Word. Uh, <laughs> can I help you with that? And, and, and what are the sort of uh, yeah. dynamics around that, the ethics, and is that a yeah. good thing? So yeah, we've already built something like that, um, mm -hmm. where if we, in some of our instances, if we detect that your account is locked, we'll automatically call the phone number on file. So you can set it up that way at least. And then it's a bot calling. Yeah, it's a bot calling It says, hey, you just got locked out of your account. Do you want to unlock your account? <laughs> like I need to have some information to open it up, right? And so, yes, that is absolutely gonna happen. I think though that not all of the interactions need to be through conversation, right? So there are gonna be some where you need, the machine needs to explain something to you and so conversation is good. But there's a really interesting couple of papers that came out of um, mostly people out of Art Center about this, this concept of animistic design. Um, for bots and for intelligences. And so we expect intelligences to be like us a lot of the time. Um, but the reality is, is that animistic is, is kind of this religious concept where I think Shintoism and Native American religions tend to focus on this, that everything has a spirit of some type. And so even the desk, even animals. And so it allows us to interpret the world in some way when we talk about these types of religion systems. And what's really interesting is that if you have intelligence in absolutely everything that's in your world, you don't expect everything to talk to you and you don't expect everything to act like a human being. You expect it to act like it would act, right? So um, one, one example of this is that people that have been working with say metal or wooden lathes for a very, very long time, they name them, they know how they sound when they're about to break down um, and they know the intricacies of how to deal with them. And so this is us personifying in some way, but it's also allowing that thing to have a spirit that is not human being or an interaction pattern that is not human being. And so I think that's what we're gonna get to is that there's a lot of this work about what are these objects that are on my desk? 
Um, so right now it's my computer, which is like my window to all of these different applications. But maybe long term, there's some type of device that when it hears me say something negative, it says something positive in response, right? Or um, every now and then there's like a photo that's shown that's related to thing I'm talking or writing an email about to help me be more imaginative about things. So things don't have to talk to us all the time, but I think you're gonna get to this point where things are gonna be more and more active. And then my only point from previously about like how do we make these conversational agents or just agentive technology in general in service of us is how does, th how does that protect us from everything in the world talking to us? Right, which would be bad. I mean, the canonical example in advertising is that when I walk by a Starbucks, I want to be text messages a dollar off of, of a latte or something like that. No one wants that. No one ever wants that, like ever. If I walk into a Starbucks and I'm like, I want a latte, I want a dollar off there. That's what, that's what I want it. So how do we do a better job of understanding, again, context and intent is something that is core to conversational agents, but it's going to be other types of agents as well. So, but, so yes, the answer is yes and yes. And mm -hmm. eventually. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Um, I want to thank all of our, our uh, colleagues today, Chris, Kevin, Alfredo, and uh, I want to thank all of you for, for attending. Uh, I just I took some notes while everybody was, uh, was speaking, uh, just to summarize some of the things that we've uh, uh, come across today. Uh, so I think we, we've seen that bots have come a long way from sort of stupid and, and, and obnoxious uh, little bots to uh, devices uh, that you can, and, and systems that you can really have a conversation with and that can be helpful. Um, but are not, not perfect yet. Uh, Chris pointed out that uh, understanding emotion is, is very hard for, for bots still. Um, they are a very good way to combine a lot of interfaces into one. Uh, we have here in the UN, we have dozens of systems that we need to interact with, uh, Umoja and IMIS and TRIP and, and all of uh, ISEEK. And, uh, so uh, that's a very good use case for, uh, for bots, of course. Um, we, uh, we've seen some things about uh, interoperability, uh, trust, uh, ethics, uh, the uh, sort of moral crumple zones, I love that, uh, that term, and the uh, dichotomy trap, uh, the concept of being able to opt out, uh, the, the adversarial thinking and the different sort of dynamics in, in chats, uh, whisper chats and group chats. And, uh, and then we've seen some of what we've built uh, for, for use in the UN Secretariat here. Um, which is a, a, a collection of framework for uh, bots that we can create for many, many departments. So, uh, you know, whether you are here as a, a delegate representing a member state or uh, you're here as a staff from a particular department, if you have ideas of how bots could be used in your department, in your office, uh, come to us and uh, we, can, uh, we can work with you to, uh, to create these bots. Um, we'll, we'll send out the, uh, the slides to everybody who had registered and uh, who has their, their names uh, uh, on, on the list here. Um, we uh, will have another half hour or so that we'll, be, we'll all be around, so feel free to come and, and talk to any of us and we can uh, answer your questions or set up an, uh, a meeting later. Um, if you want to email us, uh, my, the best email to... Uh, uh, to, uh, to email us in general is ai at un.org. That is, uh, the team uh, looks at that for, for anything related to uh, bots or other, uh, other AI technologies and even blockchain. Um, there's, uh, the, the team also produces documentation on many of the emerging technologies, so I brought two along here. Uh, this is an example of what we call a brochure. That's more sort of a popular explanation. And uh, this one is on natural language processing. We'll include it in, uh, in, an, in a follow-up <coughs> email to those who uh, to registered. And uh, this is another type of paper, which we call a white paper. And that really goes into uh, sort of the, the deep technical details, uh, in this case, on natural language processing. But we have other ones on, on blockchain and, and other ones. So that's another resource for you to, uh, uh, to look at. Um, if you're excited after this session and you want to uh, try it out for yourself, come back in this room at 2 o'clock 
and we'll have a workshop where if you bring your laptop, and I think you, you also need a Google account, right? To, uh, you need an account with Google's and Gmail account or something. Um, uh, and and uh, then we'll teach you how to build your own little bot. Um, and uh, yeah, check on iSeq and, and the UN Journal for upcoming Technovation talks. Uh, we have two sort of in, in the works, uh, one on uh, data, especially open data, and one on biotech. Uh, so they, they will, uh, and there might be other ones as well. And if you have suggestions of things that you'd love to learn about, let us know, and uh, we can uh, see if we can plan that in. So with that, thanks, everyone. iPad, is that Alfredo? Can oh, does it work on iPad? Yeah, I'm not completely sure, but it should work. Um, we'll try. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks everyone. <laughs>